passing the torch on to me. Uh, today we have Senator Ana Caballero uh, giving an update on the potential impact of Buy American legislation. Senator Caballero represents District 14. She was not, the, not only the first female mayor of the city of Salinas, but also the first Latina elected to represent the 28th Assembly District in 2006. Uh, and I believe after that you also chaired the Assembly Agriculture Committee for a time as well, and then uh, later switched over to the Senate. Um, so a long history and uh, some, some great leadership in a lot of areas with rural issues and agricultural issues. So just diving right into it, the topic of our conversation is about Buy American legislation. So just wanted to start off here a little bit, just uh, talking about the importance of this type of legislation. What, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to your district? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, and good morning to everybody. Hopefully you've had your first cup of coffee working on your side. It doesn't look like it. <laughs> good morning, everybody. That's much better. Um, well, so let me just say that, uh, that all of the, the districts have changed during that period of time. But suffice it to say that every district that I've represented, and there have been two in the assembly, the 28th and the 30th, um, and then uh, two in the Senate, the 12th and the 14th, have been rural agricultural districts. And so the economy depends on agriculture, and the people that live there depend on agriculture, whether they're working in the trucking industry, the food processing industry, or they're working out in the fields. Um, they, they all depend on agriculture. And as I've talked to farmers, one of the challenges that, um, well, and a couple of things. One is, um, a number of years ago, a uh, food processing facility in Modesto closed. It was the Seneca peach um, producer. And the reason that they closed was that they were facing imports from China that were undercutting their ability to uh, produce a good product. And a lot of their product was used in the schools. And so as, as I was talking to farmers around the area, what became very clear to me is that um, many of the small farmers in particular have a hard time marketing their, their pro produce. Um, they are dependent on the brokers, and the brokers are the ones that are making the money. Um, the farmers are making a small percentage of what the produce is actually sold for. And so when you talk about trying to figure out how can we make agriculture in California more competitive, given that we have some of the highest standards, we have the highest standards in the world, both in terms of the environment, in terms of um, the uh, labor, uh, the uh, access to water or lack of access to water. It, it, it was really clear to me that one of the markets that ought to be absolutely secure is our markets where we're feeding our children um, and that we should be feeding our children the highest quality uh, uh, pro produce in the world, um, the highest quality food in the world. And when I looked at it further, there were a number of studies that showed that where the schools are buying their, or, or the schools are buying products from other countries. So the fish sticks, you all remember eating fish sticks at school? That was the one lunch you didn't want to have to eat, right, on Fridays. Um, those fish sticks are caught by Russian trawlers and they're, they're, um, they're, they're, packaged um, and produced for market in China. And so it, when you start looking at that and understanding that, that the foreign competition is, is big in our state, it's easy to access those foreign markets, we need to do whatever we can to make, ensure that we're feeding our kids the best quality, highest quality uh, product and that we're also supporting our farmers and, um, and the, the people that live in the community. Is there any movement on this uh, that you're seeing uh, coming up going forward? Have you been working on this still? We are still working on it. So let me just say that uh, Buy American is a federal program. And what we did is we took that uh, Buy American and, um, and said, if your product is uh, no more than 25% higher than the foreign product, the priority should be to buy American. And it's buy California and is really what it amounts to since we, we produce so much. Um, the, uh, the objection to the bill came very, very late and it was not until it hit the last committee in the assembly that the school districts um, and the school district administrators opposed the bill. So when you think about it, 
you know, pub public schools are paid by taxpayers. So to have a taxpayer-sponsored organization that, um, opposing a, a, a bill that would prioritize buying American uh, didn't make a lot of sense to me. But, but we, what we did is we promised we'd be back this year and we'd work on funding. And so we've continued to work on it. Um, and we've, we've had some um, Zoom meetings with some of the school districts that have the hardest um, challenge. Understand that there are some school districts that cook or prepare the food in kitchens. And there are some school districts that, that buy it packaged already and they're not doing any preparation. They have no kitchen, in other words. Um, they're just bringing it in from someone else that's producing the, f or, or, um, producing the meal. And so we have differences between the two. And we've been trying to work with everybody to, so that we can understand what the challenges are and try to create the opportunity to buy. And one of the issues is how do we get some of the small farmers to play locally because the way that the schools order food is they order it a year ahead of time. And they go through brokers like Cisco, some of the big companies, and they're not looking at the small farmers in the region, and they're not, look, they're not looking at the farmers in the region. They'll get it from anywhere. So we're changing the way things are, are happening at schools, and we're trying to do it in a way that recognizes it may cost more, that we may need to prepare platforms where they can avoid the Cisco's and go directly to a farmer and, and purchase and make it more profitable for farmers and, and other producers because we're talking about the canneries as well. It, it sounds like, uh, you know, I'm in a budget deficit that that's going to be take some more creative solutions there to try to find that funding and figure out uh, how to make that more efficient then, huh? Well, I think what, what, what is really good is, um, I, and I saw Secretary Ross here today, um, she has resources. What, so what has happened is that, that Buy American, the Buy American bill was just one piece of the puzzle. It's also creating these platforms and um, information systems to be able to connect the farmers directly with the schools. And Secretary Ross has resources and, um, and people, talented people, that are working on it um, as we speak. So uh, I'm really pleased that we have, we've had the foresight both in terms of the administration and, um, and this bill as well, to plan for the kind of coordination we're gonna need if we really wanna do this. We're changing the way that our, our food is viewed by the schools and by the opportunities for, for farmers and, and rural communities to see more economic opportunity. Okay, and switching gears a little bit, um, kind of staying on the topic of uh, protecting agriculture in your district and trying to find some opportunities for that. Uh, you had some interesting leg legislation to address the ag labor shortage. Would you mind uh, describing that and uh, what's the latest on it? So um, part, of, part of my frustration um, as we look at, at agriculture and the lack of labor, especially over the past few years, and the transition to um, H-2A, a de dependence on the H-2A program, is that, um, is that it creates these tension in communities where there are people who um, are working, but that, well, who are working, who were determined to be essential workers during the pandemic, so they continued working, and yet they can be deported if they're discovered. And, and, and it creates this, um, this uh, tension in many of our communities between, um, with families that are of, of, of mixed status and also tension for, for the, um, the ag industry because um, you're required to do some due diligence and, uh, and yet you have a crop to get out of the field. So, um, my frustration with the federal government is that I don't see, and immigration is a federal issue, I don't see the federal government in the near future ever dealing with the fact that we have a lot of undocumented workers in our, in our communities, in California particularly, that uh, need to be legalized, and, so, and that should be eligible to be legalized. Uh, and so I'm working on a bill right now that would pro provide an opportunity for the governor to meet with the federal government and to see if we can work on a 
pilot program in California to legalize uh, people that have been working. And, and the reason this becomes really important is that, is that they're paying into Social Security. They're paying into unemployment. So we're trying to craft all these programs on the side that um, will provide unemployment benefits, but if they could only access their own unemployment benefits, they, 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 could, um, they could use those benefits. So, so the idea would be to craft a solution for California that would legalize um, people working in the agricultural industry that can prove they've been working there for five years um, and, uh, and that have no criminal record. It, it's, uh, it's mirrored after the blue card that was being proposed by the federal government. The idea would be that, that we would legalize a lot of workers and would pull people out of the shadows that, 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 are, that haven't been able to either get uh, a false <laughs> um, document to be able to work and it would provide an opportunity to, to look at um, helping rural, it's rural communities, right? Because now all of a sudden they're eligible for, for, for benefits and, um, and, and can feel part of the community. Mm -hmm. I believe that just advanced out of the assembly, or Senate, sorry, uh, yes, recently. Yes, it's on its way to the assembly. And uh, have you been working with the administration on this? Is there any response? Um, you know what, we've, we've been talking to the administration about, about all of our bills, and um, some of them are, are more critical um, than others, but uh, I can't say that we've received a response back. Um, I, I think the governor will sign, it, sign something that goes across his death, I, desk. I think he understands the, uh, the critical nature of solving what has been an intractable problem, given that California has been a sanctuary state and, a, and, and really provided, I, the only state in the nation, I think, that provided COVID benefits, tried to provide COVID benefits for undocumented workers. And uh, switching gears a little bit to what's probably been your main focus for this session is talking about uh, trying to find some support for rural hospitals. Uh, you had the Madera Community Center that closed at the start of the year, and there's just been a lot of attention, specifically in the legislature, for this. Can you describe the situation and what's, uh, what have you been working on? Yes, so that, that uh, is an issue I did not think I'd be doing this year. So it's been a disaster, really, for the, the county of Madera. So, so long story about the hospital that I won't go into, mostly because it's, it's, um, it's, it's not, you know, you can look back and go, oh gee, if only this, this, and this, that's not gonna solve the problem. What, what, what came up once the hospital closed is that I had, um, so, so my, my district right now is parts of Merced, Madera, and Fresno, and what was, um, removed from the district was the Salinas Valley and San Benito County. But those two areas, Salinas and San Benito County, are now part of what I'm caretaking because they don't have a senator right now. And so they'd be left um, orphaned and abandoned. And so um, San Benito County uh, informed me just around the same time that they had a hospital, um, the Hazel Hawkins Hospital that was in financial distress as well. And so, so I had two hospitals, one that was closed now and one that was um, teetering. And uh, when I contacted the hospital association, they advised me there were seven or eight hospitals that would close this year if something was, wasn't done, and another seven or eight next year. And although they couldn't give me the names of the hospitals, because the minute you announce that a hospital is in financial distress, that's when the doctors and the nurses start leaving. Um, they, they said, they told me the names of the senators that were at risk of losing a hospital. So I got the senators together immediately and we started doing a, um, meetings with everybody, all the stakeholders, the, um, the in, uh, insurance company, the healthcare organizations, the hospitals, um, the um, unions, uh, ev everybody, and, um, and, and basically started organizing around what it, we need a short-term solution right now to bring this hospital back, but then we need a longer term solution. So number one, the $150 million in this, this current year's budget, um, is a, it's a plug hole. It's not even a finger in the dike because it's not gonna bring back Madera and, and do anything. But, but, but the hospitals that we know that, are, that have announced is um, Kawea in Tulare, um, Beverly in um, Whittier, and two hospitals in 
um, Coachella, and um, El Centro. So mostly rural hospitals. Um, so, so, so what we're working on is the short-term solution was 150 million in this year's budget. The Senate has 400 million on an ongoing basis in next year's, which starts July 1st. Um, and then uh, the discussions brought up the MCO tax, which is the managed care organizations tax, which has, was a, a financial tool that was developed by the Brown administration in conjunction with the hospitals to bring in revenue that was used to backfill hospital spending from the general fund. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't new money to hospitals or, or medical providers for Medi-Cal, but it was money that helped stabilize the general fund during a time of, of great deficit. And so the governor had that in his January budget to do the exact same thing, which is backfill now that we're in a deficit. And um, the discussion has been to um, increase it and it's a tax on the managed care organizations. It brings in new federal dollars, which is incredibly important to stabilize the situation. And then, um, and, and so what we've been discussing is doing that kind of a program, but also adding parts that help us solve problems that we have with our health care. Um, and right now, anybody that's brought in 5150 that has mental health issues ends up being chained to a chair in the emergency room until somebody can see them. And it's disturbing to patients. It's disturbing to the staff at hospitals. It takes staff away from dealing with the real emergencies that may be there. And, um, and so we're trying to figure out, are there ways for us to do use this MCO tax that gets us with these 5150s not in the hospital, maybe at a triage, um, are there other things we can do with it, like provide um, tuition reimbursement mm -hmm. for doctors and nurses that go to rural communities? Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're also looking at the possibility of creating a partnership with the UC system mm -hmm. so that we can bring in the UC uh, talent and, um, and help us use the hospitals that we have in our communities, in our rural communities, as teaching hospitals so that they would be very, very similar to what um, UC San Francisco does. So there's some exciting opportunities about all of that, but we should have been taking years to do this, and we're trying to do it where I, I feel like we're, we're, we're fixing the engine of an airplane when it's in the, in the air and it's, it's, you know, it, mm -hmm. it could fall at any minute, but so far people have been real focused on getting things done um, and the challenge is the assembly because um, they have a different process, and I'm just mm. not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure where they're going to be. Yeah. Okay, we have a few minutes left here. I want to switch gears to just a small topic, which is the theme of our conference, and talk about water. Water. Yeah. You have a bill. You got uh, some whiskey? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we'll fight over the water later. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, you have a bill that, that's uh, talking about setting a new target for uh, expanding our storage, our water supply. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and the, the goals that you have set here? And actually, before everybody gets excited about storage, it really isn't about storage because then I wouldn't be able to get it through the legislature. Um, what, what, we're, what we're trying to do here is, um, we have a water plan in the state of California. Did you know that we have a water plan? And the plan is over 20 years old. That's why it's not a plan. It's not even anything anymore. And so um, what my bill does is it's very simple. I, and I've been trying for years to get water legislation passed, and it's been impossible. So I just think that before we do any bonds, any more bonds, or before we do, um, um, you know, before we end up in this situation where we're, we leave 500,000 to a million acres of agriculture out of production, and then we just put solar panels and call it a day. Um, we got to figure out how we're going to manage our water system so that it's fair to everyone. Because when you read articles about the drought, what you read is ag needs to stop using water. And that's ridiculous, because agriculture gets water from the same place that uh, San Francisco gets water. Do you ever hear about San Francisco reducing their water use? Or that they're taking water from Hetch Hetchy, which is really uh, water that should be um, going, going in a different direction other than being piped over to San Francisco. So suffice it to say that um, 
I've come to the conclusion that, that water storage above ground is probably never going to happen in California. And we need to figure out then what is the infrastructure we need in place so that we can move water around the state and we can ensure that we can continue to feed the world because that's what we, that's what we do. And so um, my my bill just basically says we we need to create we need to update our water plan and make our state drought proof and resilient uh, to the um, these atmospheric rivers and the and the droughts that 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 come through. Um, and it sets as a target by 2030. No, by 2040, it's not even it's not even 2030. By 2040, that we um, that we identify 10 million acre feet of water in order to stabilize our water supply system. And it had a, a, a target of by 2050, 15 million acre feet. And people just went crazy about that number because it wasn't based on anything. So when have you heard us? setting numbers for goals that are not based on reality. I mean, come on, we do it all the time. But all of a sudden, because we're doing it for water, everybody got, they said that I was trying to, uh, I don't know. They, the, 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 the paranoia was that I wasn't, um, I didn't appreciate conservation enough. I appreciate conservation, but we can't get there with conservation. It's going to take a whole heck of a lot more. And it means we're going to have to do recycling. We're going to have to figure out how to do more of this flood control so it doesn't go out to the ocean. We have to build the infrastructure for that. We have to be able to cro uh, go across and up and down the valley so that you, you can move water in a way that makes sense. And so the bill doesn't say that. It just says we need a new updated plan and we need um, some targets that, that we meet that we work towards. Okay, great. Uh, that's a good segue for our next discussion, too. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, Senator Caballero, for the uh, update. I'm, I'm sure we have some uh, lingering questions for water availability and navigating these weather extremes, uh, along with uh, labor shortages and regulatory challenges in California. So now I'm going to introduce our next speaker to come up here. We have. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.